Our Father, we are grateful to be in your house today. As your people, we have come into your presence. It is our desire to hear your voice speaking to our needs. Speak, Lord, we are listening. Convey your will and your word to us and then grant us grace and power to live it. We bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, once again, happy Sabbath, everyone. It is indeed a blessing to be here with you this morning. And it's, it is indeed our last Sabbath in this official capacity, but I don't want to say it's the last Sabbath we'll be with you <laughs> in this official capacity. And we would uh, love to come again sometime and visit with you and probably indeed will. Um, it has been a blessing for us. It um, has been an, uh, an eight-year endeavor, eight years this month. We are grateful for God who, who led us to this community and this district and gave us the responsibility in which we had to learn to negotiate and learn and grow. And so we have grown uh, through the eight years by God's grace. And I think that because of our connection with you, we have become better people uh, by God's grace. And it has not hurt us at all. And we are just delighted, always enjoy uh, coming to uh, Linwood. Um, we, we know we're going to uh, get some blessed music and hymns. And I was, when I came in this morning, I was sharing with, um, with, with Joyce there the, the hymns you were singing earlier for Sabbath school and just how blessed it was. And sorry, I, I didn't get those hymns this morning, but... Uh, uh, the blessed hymns you were singing. So it's good to be with you. It's good to always be in your presence. Uh, we will indeed miss being with you. I thought, uh, what shall I say as a concluding message? You probably have noticed uh, part of my theme for the time I've been with you. My desire is to just lift up Jesus, point you to the cross, point you to Jesus. Each Sabbath has been my objective, and in doing that, to challenge you uh, a little bit each time. Uh, and I want to do the same thing today. I had listed, because I sent it out earlier, the title of Journeying Without Jesus. Um, you can keep that thought in mind. I have indeed changed the title, but uh, the, the text is the same, but the title has changed as I was working or the Holy Spirit was working with me. Uh, just last evening, uh, the title changed and it is now such as, Are You Sure? Are You Sure? We like to look at uh, our passage today, which is found in Luke, the second chapter beginning at verse 43. Luke the second chapter, beginning at verse 43. And I'd like to read into your hearing from the King James, and then we will proceed with the message for the morning, and um, we see what the Spirit says to us. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 43. And when they had fulfilled the days... They returned, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. I want, I, it just struck me that I want you to, in your own leisure and time, if you consider that passage there, that phrase, Jesus tarried behind. <laughs> uh, 
It's worthy of your spending some time contemplating that. When Jesus tarries in your experience, how does it affect you? Work with that a little bit. Think on that. Let's move to verse uh, 44 now. But they, 44 is my main text where I want to extrapolate the message this morning. But they, supposing, my key word for the day, they supposing him to have been in the company went a day's journey and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? <laughs> Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, they were the culprits. It was their fault. They left him. <laughs> and they come back and they accuse him. <laughs> and Jesus, at the age of 12, says to them, How is it that ye sought me. Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Very interesting. Another point that I won't get into in this message today, but it is worthy of your contemplation. I want to encourage you that when you hear messages Sabbath after Sabbath, that you will go home and take that passage and, and, and mull over it, meditate on it, and try to extrapolate more than what the preacher gives you from it. Uh, squeeze it a little bit more, you know. Uh, it's like a lemon. You take, you put it in that squasher and you squeeze it out, but then you, you try to get every little drop that's left in it. Do that with the passage. And so I want to encourage that you with this passage today because I'm going to focus on verse 44, but you take the whole pericope. But verse 44, which uh, says that and they supposing, that's the word that caught my attention. Suppose is a verb. The gerund or the present participle is supposing, which is equivalent to hypothesizing, is a hypothesis or a supposition, if you please, or even speculation. You might even would say it's a hunch. It's a pretty good feeling. <laughs> they had a feeling he was in the crowd. Don't miss me now. I want you to stick with me today. They had, because I'm trying to leave a message with you as I, as I depart. They, they had a feeling. They had a hunch. They had a supposition. They, they, they had a hypothesis that Jesus was in the crowd, that Jesus was with them, it was a pretty good hunch, but they did not know with certainty that he was. So I want to talk about a little bit the difference or the, 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 the controversy between supposing and certainty. Supposing on one hand and certainty and assurance on the other. So when we have this uh, this supposing, this hypothesis, this good hunch, it is uh, tantamount to uh, assuming that something is the case on the basis of evidence and probability, but without proof or certain knowledge. They think it's so. They have something they call evidence, but it is not enough to be certain that it is true or certain that it is. It is an assumption. 
uh, assume, take for granted, presume. The other arm of that is assurance. Assurance, which is uh, a positive declaration intended to give confidence. Or shall I use the word certainty? It is a firm conviction that something is the case. It's a sure thing. It's a foregone conclusion without doubt. Do you have fellowship with Christ continually or not? It's a key question. Do you have fellowship with Christ continually or not? Is it a foregone conclusion or is it a supposition? My sermonic sentence today that will permeate the message that I want you to get here is that with regard to the Lord Jesus, we ought to leave nothing as a matter of supposition. When it comes to the Lord Jesus, <laughs> we ought to not leave anything to a matter of supposition or feeling or a good hunch. We ought to know with some certainty whether he is with us or not. That's what we want to talk about this morning. Can we, you and I, lose fellowship with Christ? Can we lose fellowship with him? Is it really possible? I think our passage makes it clear that indeed it is possible. You may have uh, Jesus with you today. You may. But he can be gone tomorrow. You may have him with you this minute, but he can be gone in the next. And so the question is, uh, do you have continually unbroken fellowship, communion with him? Is he with you now? Will he be with you as you move forward? A word of caution to those who say, I got him. <laughs> I've had him for a long time in my life. I, 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 I've had him and he isn't going any place. I have him for sure. Be careful as you offer that proposition. Uh, Mary had him for 12 years. And she had him much deeper than you and I. She, she really literally had him embedded in her, growing in her day by day. She had him for 12 years. I, I find it amazing, again, that uh, the angel gave uh, Jesus to Mary and to Joseph and told them to care for him and keep him safe. And the angel even came to him uh, early after his birth and said, go on down to Egypt for they intend to kill him and, 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 and protect him. And, and the angel had given them warning. And yet on this occasion, when his first trip up to the temple in Jerusalem, they go and they somehow forget about him in the crowd. They went to church and forgot Jesus. <laughs> you know, it, 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 listen to this. I find it humorous. It's as if they went to church and left Jesus at church and went home the same way or worse than they came did when they, when, when they left home. They left home with Jesus, went to church to worship Jesus and left him there and went home. That's equivalent to you going out of this place without Jesus. You know, it is possible. My prayer, my aim, my, my objective, my desire for you and for me is that when we leave here, not only will those out there know that we have been with Jesus, they will even know that he is with us as we go forth. More and moreover, my objective in the message today is that we will know that he is with us. It doesn't matter how long you've had him. If you don't have him, 
this moment. Don't miss that. It doesn't matter how long you've had it, how long you've been in the church, how long you've been doing this, how long you've been walking in the way. If you don't have him this moment, what you had is not relevant anymore. It's having him in the moment. Suppose everyone who darkened the doorway of the church were compelled to stand up and publicly confess their spiritual condition today. What a shock it probably would be on the occasion on earth and what an uproar uh, of merriment Satan and his minions uh, would have to hear us express our spiritual condition. Many Christians have lost Jesus in Jerusalem, the world. Still more in the temple, in the church. He was left in the church according to this passage. And he was, he was left, not lost, by those who loved him. Mary and Joseph loved him. If anybody loved him, they loved him. And yet, they left him behind. When the question is put, how was it done? How can one lose fellowship with Christ? The answer varies. The language of the, the prophet, uh, to the prophet, uh, uh, the king Ahab, concerning the prisoner he was to keep and not lose, seems very fitting. The reply was, as thy servant was busy, here and there, lo, he was gone. Many say, I cannot tell how it happened. But one day I woke up and the fact that the Savior was no longer with me is like that of Samson. I woke up and knew not, the text says, he woke up and knew not that the Lord had departed from him. Wow. Let us ask ourselves, how is it that Christians lose the sense of fellowship with Jesus? What are the dangers that we have most in regard in this respect? The danger arises in, and I, I want to just look at the passage itself for a minute contemplate the passage. What are the dangers? What are the, the challenges of, of losing or missing fellowship with Jesus? Note this, number one. The first danger arises in fellowshipping with others. You follow what I'm saying? The first danger arises in in socialization, socializing. They went up to Jerusalem with Jesus. Now this was a feast. In other words, it was a convocation, it was camp meeting. <laughs> I wonder how many folk at camp meeting just lose Jesus altogether. On Sabbath, just kicking balls everywhere, can hardly wait to get out of the the auditorium to go eat in the tents and all the, you know, fellowship. They're just laughing and even walking in, you're trying to have church and you walk in there and folk are having no conversation like they're on the football field. Are you all listening to the preacher? Fellowshipping, coming to church, sitting up in church, talking, having, all, having a, a regular conversation in church. I mean, coming to worship Jesus, and this was the thing. They were there at this feast. I, I get it in your head now. This was not just a small gathering. This was a major annual festival, and people all over came to this festival. It was crowded everywhere, and they were socializing and catching up for the year. They hadn't seen one another, and just talking, and, and you know, there's, there's not a, a lack of, of lying and a whole lot of talking. So just talking and chatting, socializing, and in the midst of that socializing, forgot Jesus. Kept on walking and forgot Jesus. Think about it. Another note, number two, the thing that causes us to lose 
the Savior, and as we walk, as we converse even, is the gossiping. Can you imagine all the gossiping that was carrying on? Oh, child, I haven't seen you in a year. Let me tell you about what's been going on. Just gossiping. When we start to gossip, we have a way of, 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 of wounding the Savior. He doesn't want to gather around folk who are gossiping and carrying on. And so we end up uh, losing the sense of his fellowship with us. Thirdly is the danger of losing the consciousness of the presence of Christ in religious gatherings. You know, we come together so often, and we ought to meet together often, the scripture says. But as we do, we get in the habit, the habit of meeting, and it's a religious meeting, and we presuppose that he is there. We just, you know, it's just automatic. We go, we dress up, he's there, you know. Uh, and, and we just take it for granted. That's that supposing Jesus is there instead of knowing that he is there. And there's a difference. I've tried to indicate that at the very beginning between assuming and surmising and conjecturing and supposing that he is present and then actually knowing that he is present. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be able to go home and say, oh, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us as we were there today? Not the preacher, but Jesus. To know that you have been in his presence. And isn't it something that when individuals can be with you and know that Christ has been with them? You know, I was told long ago as I, I visit uh, individuals in the hospital, that it's not just you showing up, preacher. That when you show up, it's Jesus. You know, you're there representing him. And Jesus shows up. Is it that way with you as you visit, not only the hospitals, but people in your community? Is it as if Jesus shows up because he is there with you? You want to know that he's with you, not supposing, but know that he is with you. Know that you are representing him on all occasions. Now, that's just a few. Let me, let me see if I can get back to the notes. How is it that Christians lose the sense of the fellowship of Jesus? One, it's about three, four things I want to share here really quickly. One is that we lose him in the bustle of life. We lose him in the bustle of life. Let me tell you one thing that I do uh, to help me in this area. And, and, and I, I commend it to you. What I'm saying is, and now more than ever, is anybody in here that isn't busy? I think I've talked to you about that before. Whether you have a full-time job or not, you are probably busy, inundated even, so much so that if you are not careful, if you're not particular about getting up at a specific time and having your devotion, you will not have it. Do I have a witness? And what I do is intentionally, three or four times a year, I carve out days. I put, when I start my calendar year, I put dates in there that I will have for solitude and aloneness. Not vacation time, but solitude. These days, I plan to be in solitude, just me and Jesus. Three, four times a year. Because if I don't do that, I will be bustled out of my relationship with him. I'll be standing in the pulpit thinking he's with me and I'm just here alone. And you'll be looking at me and you won't be fed. And if you are going to represent him, I mean, I, I'm not talking about something that, that I created. It's something that Jesus himself did. <laughs> he went alone in solitude out to pray. I mean, he, he got by himself. He told the disciples, come ye apart and rest a while. Come with me. <laughs> I like that. Come with me. Come apart. Just hang out with me. All I want you to do, don't try to minister all the time. Take a break. Spend some time with me alone. If you don't do that, you will soon discover you have lost him a long time ago. Because the world 
Even the church will bustle you out of your relationship and fellowship with him. May God help us. In most cases, there is no flagrant sin that bustles us out of our relationship with Jesus. It's just this thing of busyness and always occupied. Our minds are just filled all the time with stuff. You know, give one thing, you get rid of one thing, something else is in its place. Two things is in its place. It just, it just happens that way. It just happens that way. May God help us. The second thing, the answer suggests that by the circumstances in the passage, that bef the passage before us, that it is, it is done through carelessness. We lose the sense of his fellowship through carelessness or heedlessness. Again, I want to reiterate that if your life is not intentional about developing and nurturing your relationship with Jesus, you probably don't have a good one. You hear me this morning? This is something that we have to be intentional about. And so it is the carelessness. Note the, the, the parents of Jesus now. They, they were supposing him to be in a crowd. They did not see him with them. They did not have eyes on him. They just supposed he was in the crowd, that he knows what to do, and we're heading in the right direction. And they left the church, the worship service, and they headed home. They traveled an entire day and never saw Jesus and kept going. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Have you ever done that? Just got up and started your day without prayer and stopping to, to see what the Lord would have to say to you about your day and meeting him first in the day and just rush right on. And all the time, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. All the time, they are getting further and further away from him. And they didn't even know it. They were just assuming, the text says, supposing him to be in the crowd. Well, as I was intimating earlier, and I'll say it a little bit later too, you can't go on that you think he's, he's in here or he's in somebody else. Somebody else has him. <laughs> you have to know whether you have him or not. You know, mama may have him, papa may have him, but God bless the child that's got his own, you know, that you have the relationship with him. And it doesn't matter whether they have him or not. It doesn't matter whether he's in the building or not. It, what matters is, is he in here or not? That's the, that's the final analysis. Is he in here or not? That matters to me most. Remember the ten virgins. It was while they were slumbering at midnight that the midnight cry came. It was while the man slept that his enemy sowed tares in his field. It was while Christ was agonizing in the garden that the disciples were asleep. And he had admonished them over and over again. And I'm admonishing you now in the words of Christ. Watch, he says. Watch. When you read in Desire of Ages that we're told there that had Peter and those disciples, had they been watching in the garden when they were sleeping, they would not have uh, denied him. Uh, they will not have fled and left him. They would have been prepared for the crisis that they were to meet that very night. But the crisis arose and they were not prepared. They were not prepared. Christ was not with them. Thirdly, but how does the thing itself happen? What are the steps to the departure from Christ? I have just a few words for you in this regard. How or what are the steps? Know this. 
Christ is lost or left gradually. It's not something major up front. It's not some big fall or calamity, you know. It's just gradual. God loves us too much to just leave us and abandon us. But we move from him. The illustration would be that you have two ships traveling together and they are one degree in difference in the ships. Soon, they will disappear from each other and be thousands of miles apart. Listen to that. By being one degree off as they travel, those ships will soon lose sight of each other and be miles apart. All we need is to be out of step with Christ in one degree. If you've committed one, you've committed all. If you're out of step in one degree, that degree will eventually lead you further and further and further from him. And all the time, listen to me carefully today, we will be supposing he is with us. Remember my question in, in the sermon title, are you sure? Supposing ain't surety. <laughs> what we want is certainty that he is indeed with us. The instance we cease moving on the parallel of a perfect consecrated life, the fact of distance and the additional fact of an ever widening distance between us and him and the final disappearance of Christ out of the heart and life becomes a veritable reality in the eyes of others as the spectacle of the parting ship on the ocean. Another illustration, it is seen that not by one great evil act are men parted from the Lord, but it is by the number of little acts of which they are very grave and alarming. Just as a person does not get off of a high ladder or tower uh, by jumping down from the top. Edgar, we were just talking about being up on those high scaffolds and so forth. Uh, you don't just drop down. I mean, that thing doesn't drop. If you're on the ladder, you just, it doesn't, you just don't jump down those feet. You have to come down one rung at a time, one inch at a time until you are on the ground. It's descending in just that way. So the Christian rarely ever brings himself down the way from the presence of Christ by one gross sin, but is by a long line of little things. Little things. Unspiritual, objectable, Reprehensive is an increasing degree that the calamity of the loss of the Savior takes place, degree by degree. Often the process is gradual, almost imperceptible. This is why, in, in light of the, the, the message this morning, our behavioral purpose, what I want you to get out of this message, the behavioral purpose says this, develop the habit of checking several times a day to affirm the presence of Christ in your life. Develop the habit of checking, affirming, confirming, several times during the day that Christ is with you. Now, work with me just for, for, for a moment here. Let me, let me just stop here. If, if you are traveling as a parent, uh, even if you're at camp meeting, and, and if you don't know where your children are, at least it used to be a thing, you know, you knew where your children are. There was a commercial, you know, you know where your children are. You know, 
You keep up with your children. You want to have an idea of where they are. You want them to be right where you can see eye on them. I want you to stay right out here where I can see you. I mean, that's, isn't that what we call a responsible parent? Now you give them a little bit of room. You let them play. You let them do a little something. But I want you out here where I can see you. And the moment you can't see, but you, you start calling, hey, Christian, hey, hey, Willis, you know, you, where are you? Stay where I can see you. That's good parenting, right? Well, some, somebody may say, well, that's helicopter parenting. <laughs> well, let it be. But when it comes to, to care for about your children, when it comes to dealing with the Lord, uh, uh, when you're dealing with him, let's not assume anything as it pertains to the Lord and check in several times during the day to ascertain, yeah, he's with me. Now, how is it that we do that? Uh, how is it that we do that? Before I get there, I mean, I mean the, the, there's Christ's object lesson, page 155. The term of the Lord is talking about Peter and his fall and what he ended up doing. She says that Peter's fall was not instantaneous. It was not instantaneous. Listen to this. Self-confidence led him to belief, to the belief that he was saved and step after step was taken in the downward path until he would deny his master. Did you hear that, church? Sometimes we get pretty self-confident, don't we? That we are saved. That we're on our way to God's heaven. You know, we got it made. We, we, we are the perfect paradigm of what a Seventh-day Adventist Christian ought to be in the world today. Sometimes we get that attitude. And in doing so, we are actually on a downward trajectory, imperceptible and don't even know it, self-reliant. And in doing so, we're getting further and further away from the Savior. Listen to what the pen of inspiration says, still on Christ's object lesson 155. Never can we safely put confidence in self or feel this side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. Never, she says. Never. So, the mistake that people make once they discover that Christ is not with them, let's pose that as we look at the text for just a moment. First of all, once they discover that he's not with them, the text says that the parents went a day's journey without him. They went a day without any evidence of the presence of Jesus. Have you gone a day without evidence of his presence with you? A day's journey with no evidence of the presence of Jesus, just an assumption that he was with them. And they travel a day. Huh. They pushed on their journey forward. They kept pressing forward on their journey all the time getting further and further from him. And the second mistake was they were supposing him to be in the company. Now, this was a, 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 a most natural supposition. I mean, supposing that he was in the company of some of those that were in the group. Because Christ is such a a wonderful person who would not want to be with him. <laughs> Amen, somebody. He's such a marvelous savior. He's such a nice boy uh, at the age of 12. He's so well-mannered. Who would not want to be with him? He's such a blessing to be around. I mean, he gives such peace. Who would not want to be with him? I mean, I mean you would naturally think that everybody, every one of us would want to be with him, right? So it's a pretty good assumption that, hey, you got him, you got me. Somebody so wonderful, who does not want to be in his presence? 
So it was a pretty good assumption that he's in the crowd somewhere. Somebody is entertaining him. Somebody is talking with him. Somebody is being blessed by him. It's a pretty good assumption. And nevertheless, they were wrong. It was back at the temple that the priests and the Pharisees were reveling and marveling at his wisdom and, and as he taught them. <laughs> This, this was amazing. They were amazed, but he was not in the crowd. They left supposing that he was such a wonderful, wonderful child. Anybody would want to be in his presence, and surely he would be. Supposing Jesus to be with me. If you, let me say this and get this point, please. If you must suppose something, as it relates to Jesus. Let's err on the side of, 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 of making it into the kingdom. Is that all right? So here we go. If you must suppose something, then suppose that he is not with you. You get that? But what we want to know for certain is that he is with me. Don't let any time go by without knowing for certain that he is with me. So if you must suppose that he's with you, or suppose at all, then suppose that he is not with you. But always know for certain. How can I know that he is with me? Well, if you keep talking to him. <laughs> you know, there's a passage over in Genesis, I think it's Genesis 18, where it says Abraham. When Abraham ceased communing with him, God went up from him. That's what the passage says. When Abraham ceased communing with him, then God went up. So if you keep communicating with him throughout the day, then you know he's present with you. If you praise him, if you are thanking him, if you are talking to him throughout the day, then you know he is there. You don't have to worry about him not being there, supposing he's there. He's there because you are praising him, because you are honoring him, because you walk with him. You've invited him to be with you. That makes the difference. Well, the third thing, in terms of the, the mistake that the people were making, the third mistake was they, they sought him among their kinfolk. They sought him among the kinfolk. This is what Mary and Joseph did, and the result was that they did not find him. Are your kinfolk like my kinfolk? That if you went to your kinfolk, you probably know you're not going to find Jesus there. <laughs> the way they live and carry on, you're probably not going to find Jesus among them. And in spite of how wonderful he is, how marvelous he is, what a wonderful friend, what a wonderful savior it is, you still will not find him more times than not among your kinfolk. And yet this was their problem. They sought them among their people. And while they were doing that, guess what? They were losing time. And they end up missing Jesus for three entire days. They missed Jesus for three days. The fourth mistake that they made was that in this pertains primarily to the caravan that they were with. Do you notice in the passage the mistake that the caravan made? That entire caravan they were with, they were moving toward, going back to Nazareth, they were leaving Jerusalem. And after the caravan knew that Jesus was not with them, they knew that they were not in sync with him. He was left. He was not with them. He was lost, if you please. Mary and Joseph turned back and went looking for him. But the caravan 
went on ahead without him, knowing he was not with them. Singing, laughing, joking, talking, conversating, moving on toward home, recognizing that the Savior, that Jesus, was not with them. They did not go back with Mary and Joseph. Oh, what a travesty. What a travesty. Without the Son, the flower pines. Without Jesus, our future is bleak at best. Without Jesus, we are washed up on a desert island in the northern hemisphere. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I would surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Without him, I would be enslaved. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I would sink hopelessly into a dark, cold abyss. But with Jesus, thank God, I'm saved and there is joy in his presence forevermore. Forevermore. So what do we do when we recognize that Christ is not present? What do we do when we recognize that Christ is not present? Let me give you a few clues here and then I'm going to close. First of all, we must do as Mary and Joseph. Turn back. We must seek him with all of our hearts. The words are, when you search for me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. When you recognize that he is not present with you, don't rest until you find him. Can you imagine the parents sleeping and Christ was not with them and knowing that he was the Savior and knowing that the enemy had purpose to kill him, to destroy him, and, and, and they had somehow uh, fallen on their responsibility. Can you imagine how their heart must have beat, I mean, palpitating constantly until they found him, calling out, Jesus, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, has anybody seen Jesus, looking for Jesus. And that's what I want to say to you, that as, as you recognize that you are far from him, and most of us, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph, as we look at the passage, when you do the research, it, it describes that they were about eight miles from Jerusalem. Beeroth is about where they were, which is about eight miles, which is equivalent to about two hours walk getting back to Jerusalem. Uh, to Christ. Now, listen how encouraging this is. Listen, they were two hours from him. Most of us are less than two hours. If we, if we are parted from him at all, we're less than two hours from him. What would happen with our experience in terms of finding and securing Jesus if we spent two hours on our face in prayer, repenting and confessing and acknowledging him and seeking him and inviting him to dwell in us. If we spent two hours in solitude just praying and getting rid of all these distractions and just calling out to him, what a difference it would make. We could get up off of our knees with the assurance that he is with us as we go forth. And so I commend that to you. Keep your eyes fixed steadily upon him, praising him, thanking him, and inviting him into your life. Paul says it this way, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, looking unto him, keeping our eyes fixed on him. Him. Secondly, uh, that text was uh, Genesis 18, verse 33, with Abraham uh, did not, when he ceased talking to him, Christ went up. So keep talking to him. Keep claiming the blood. And fourthly, give Christ or get him as an indweller. Remember how those guys on the road to Emmaus, when they came to their residence, how they begged him? And the pen of inspiration said that had they not begged him, had they not entreated him to abide with them, Christ would have gone on. But they cried out to him, abide with us. Don't go any further. 
abide with us. And what we must do is we must get Christ as an indweller, not just a visitor coming and going, but let him come in and take up his abode with us and in us. John 14, 23, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and as we keep his commandments, he will come unto us and take up his abode with us. In other words, he will cease to be a visitor and become an indweller. If we invite him, if we keep his commands as he has asked us to, and we invite him, he will come in and abide with us. I didn't intend to say this, but he, listen to this. The pastor says, in essence, that when Mary and Joseph found Jesus, when they found Jesus, and I want your help on this one, what did they do? Besides, we heard the complaint. Let's go beyond the complaint now. When they found Jesus, what does the rest of the passage tell us happened? Stick with me with that passage now. Luke 2. We're at the end of the passage now. We're going all the way down. We're preparing ourselves to leave this morning. I want to hear some comments. I need some help today. I'm not going to leave you like that. What happened? What's the conclusion? I, I, I didn't hear. I heard somewhere. I didn't quite hear it said. You get it? What does that say? They said, son, don't do this. It's come with us. And he went home with them. And he abode with them. He submitted unto them, as it were, to abide with them. And the child grew in wisdom and stature. And if the child is growing in wisdom and stature, and he's abiding with them, Definitely they grew in wisdom and stature as well. And the invitation was, son, don't do this to us. Come on, let's go home. So as you leave today, don't leave Jesus here. Take him with you. Make sure, don't just suppose he's going to be with you, but know with a certainty he is with me. Because I have availed myself to him, I've made myself available, I've invited him, I'm not doing those things that will push his presence away from me. You know, the way I live and carry on, gossiping and lying and all these other small little things, cheating and being dishonest, those types of things will cause the Savior to depart from you, slowly, little by little, little by little. But what we want to do is stay in his presence, talking to him, praising him, giving honor and glory to him, inviting him, thanking him for his, his time with us. The hymn writer penned those words that Jesus is the anchor. And if ever there was a time that we need him, it is now. In times like these, hymn 593 is how we want to close today. But as our chorister comes, I want to again reiterate our sermonic sentence and behavior purpose. With regards to the Lord Jesus, we ought to leave nothing as a matter of supposition. Develop the habit of checking several times a day to confirm the presence of Christ with you. In times like these, you need a savior in times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock.